We're going to talk about synchronization for the rest of the day and next class and maybe some next week as well, because this is a, a big topic. You've used the Rust abstractions that give you synchronization already. You've used the RW arc and the mutex arc, and those basically solve the problems for you. So those basically give you this property that you can have multiple tasks that are sharing some data in a way that's safe. What we want to understand is how you would actually build something like that. And this is something that generally in your implementing a kernel that you need to do. Where are places that you need to worry about mutual exclusion in implementing a kernel? And, and I should make sure that these abstractions, right, these are part of standard lib. You do not have those when you have the no standard. Like that would be the goal to have some abstraction like those that you could use in the kernel. So your implementations for problem set four for the file system, will those work if you have multiple threads? Or did you assume there's only ever one thread interacting with your file system? Okay, good, yeah. So I assume this is true. If anyone actually built one that will work with multiple threads, definitely let us know because that would be quite impressive. But I would guess all of the file systems that you built depend on some global state, that if you had multiple threads that attempted to, say, modify a directory at the same time and interleaved in some awkward way, you'd end up with a corrupted file system. This would be bad. So lots of things inside an operating system depend on being able to know that you've got some shared state that for some period of time, no other code is going to modify, that you have some way to exclude other code from modifying that state. And you didn't have to worry about that for Iron Kernel for problem set four, because you were assuming, or at least it was implicitly assumed, that you only had one thread running. But any real operating system definitely needs to worry about that. We talked back in class 14, so this was March 18, when it was announced that Leslie Lamport won the Turing Award. And the main thing he won it for was work on making concurrency robust and safe, and being able to reason about the kinds of properties that you have when you have multiple processes or multiple computers interacting with the same state. One of the things that we mentioned was this solution to dexterous concurrent programming problem, and I promised that I would talk about it. What was next Tuesday back in March, we'll actually talk about it later today. Maybe we won't even get to it today, but we'll talk about dexterous problem and dexterous solution for it today, and we may get to Leslie Leslie Airport solution later. So this is the problem that he was solving, that Lamport's two-page paper that we mentioned back in March was about, was a solution to this problem that was posed by Edgar Dijkstra. And Dijkstra posed the problem in 1965 and set up these requirements. So the problem is you've got a set of processes. You want those processes to be running in such a way that they can't have more than one of them in a critical section at the same time. So we've got a bunch of processes, let's say they're, and whether we call them threads or processes or computers, so the way Dijkstra was thinking of this, they were separate computers sharing some storage. The way you might think of it today, well, they're separate processes that have some shared storage, or you could think of it as they're separate threads that have shared storage. So all those things are, are really, the important part of this problem is that you've got separate threads of execution, and you've got sh some shared storage between them. So in terms of the language that we use today, calling them threads probably makes the most sense because they do have some shared storage. They have a, a shared memory, so there's, each of them is running some program like this where there is a critical section, and the requirement is that at most one of those threads at a time can be inside the critical section. So if thread three enters the critical section, we need to know that no other thread will enter it until thread three is done. These are the requirements. And the assumption is, well, we can't make any assumptions about the speed that they execute. So we can't assume that there's some limit on the amount of time any one thread spends in its non-critical or critical section. This is the most important property, right? So we have safety. That's exclusion. Only one thread can be in the critical section. The second property is that they actually can make progress. Eventually, each thread gets to enter. So this is non-starvation. They all get some chance. And we're going to add the constraint, and Dijkstra had the constraint, that they're all going to be running the same program. That really simplifies the problem in some ways. It limits the kinds of solutions. But in terms of thinking of fairness in a clean solution, that seems like something we want, that they're all running the same program. 
And there are no assumptions that we can make other than that. So this is the problem. And at this point, after explaining the problem, Dijkstra's one-page paper says we should beg the challenge reader to stop here and try this yourself because it sounds kind of trivial until you actually think about it. Seems like this is about as simple as you could pose this mutual exclusion property. And the fact that they have some shared storage seems like it should be easy. So when Dijkstra begs you to do something, even if he's dead, we should still do it. So you're going to have a chance to think about this before we talk about the solution. So don't look at the back of your sheet, but work with the people nearby you, at least in groups of two or three, to see if you can solve Dijkstra's problem. What I've heard from, from a couple of years, there's a lot of confusion about what you're trying to do. So what you're given, there's some critical code, right? Your goal is to be able to run that critical code, and each of the threads has some critical code to run. You can think of this as the modifying the node structure in your file system. There's some other code, and you get to decide on this other code. This is, this is you get to create that. Your goal is to figure out what the other code should be to protect the critical section. So there's no supervisor, right? You can't assume that there's an operating system that you can ask permission for or anything like this. Everything that you're doing has to be in the code that you're coming up with now. And you're trying to come up with the code that protects the critical section. And it can do things like read and write. So you can have values in this storage that they can all read and write from. So one thing you could think about is, well, let's have some values that are in the storage, and we're going to associate them with each processor. So you could have a value that the way you write your code, say, processor i, and you, each processor knows its ID, let's assume. So you've got an ID for each processor. And you could say, well, processor i is going to write into storage pi, and the others might read it. So you can use this shared storage as a way for the processes to communicate. And you can have rules, or you can write the program in such a way that different processes will do different things with the shared storage. And your goal is to write that code in such a way that you can do some test here. Right? So you're going to do some test, and you're going to do a bunch of other things before the test to know when it's safe to enter the critical section. And the requirement is that only one process, only one of these threads can enter that critical section at the same time. And you can also add some code inside the critical section, that there's somewhere that you're doing something, that you're doing the critical thing. So your goal is to figure out all the code that goes around that to guarantee this property that only one of these threads can be in the critical section at the same time. And you've done lots of programming that has this built in. Right? So you've probably used Synchronize in Java. That's exactly what Synchronize in Java is providing. Right? It's saying that only one thread can be modifying uh, it can be entering this region or it can be calling the synchronized method at a time. So that's your goal is to figure out how to provide that without assuming that you already have it. So does that make more sense now, what, what your goal is? And so your goal is to write the code that is this program other than it should include somewhere in it the critical section that is what you really want to do. And the rest of the code is how you protect that to make sure that no other thread can be there at the same time. So that the two things that you should think about in solving this is what you want to use the shared memory for to enable this. So you definitely need to use the shared memory, because that's the only way they can communicate. So you'll have time to think about this. We'll continue next class. So you have Dijkstra's solution in code on the back, um, as well as Leslie Lamport's solution. And those solutions are fairly short programs, but not that easy to understand. I hope you'll think about your own solutions as well as try to understand those. What we'll do next class is, is actually look at this and understand why it works before leaving you with that. So these kinds of problems come up in real systems that we use. So where does this exact kind of problem that Dijkstra was describing come up in a system like Collab? Are there critical sections that we want mutual exclusion for? OK, good, yeah. So if we have multiple users editing the same content, could be a, a page in Collab, or it could be the grades file, or something like that, well, we don't want those ed edits happening at the same time. Right? There's some critical section where the edit actually happens, 
And we want to know that only one process can do that, because otherwise the file might get corrupted and all the information gets lost. So how do we think Collab actually solves this? This is a, you know, UVA spends more than a million dollars a year supporting this and has probably spent about 20 million total into it. So pretty much all of your tuition in this class is just going to support Collab this year. How are they solving this problem? Okay, so you're on the right track. So the, so the guess is they don't and they have some definitive version based on whatever happens to happen last. It's pretty close, but this is a very advanced system. They're better than that. They couldn't spend a million dollars a year on this without having something better than just hoping they get lucky. So what they actually do, so you can read the best practices for working with Collab. So the best practices for working with Collab are don't allow multiple people to use it at the same time. So this is not quite as good as just guessing that some last version is correct. It's telling your users you better not allow multiple people to use it and definitely don't allow multiple browsers and don't click more than once. One solution is to tell your users or put the burden on the users of the system to not have events happen at unexpected times. This is not a good solution. Certainly not something an operating system kernel or a web developer should find acceptable. But according to Colab, it's fine. It's just the best practice and it's the user's own fault if they, they happen to do anything like this. For next class, we will look at Dijkstra solution and we'll talk about Leslie Lampart solution and other issues related to how do you provide this kind of mutual exclusion. Between now and then, try to think about this and you, you do have the code on the back of your sheet. 